Hey, everybody. Welcome to Before College TV Live. Today is a very special conversation with students from Vanderbilt University. I am so excited to have you here. Batanya, Safa, Toby, Shun, welcome. I'm really excited because I meet so many students who want to go to Vanderbilt and have this dream of going to Vanderbilt. And it's really hard to get into Vanderbilt. And it's expensive, right? For like a lot of people. So I understand that you are all first generation students, meaning that you're the first ones in your family to go to college here in the United States. Is that correct? So awesome. So we're going to learn about your experiences and how you're able to navigate those changes. And we're also going to just get to know you. So to kick things off, Batanya, I would love to know about you. Just give me like a quick summary of like where you're from, like what you were like in high school, just so people who are watching can see if they could identify with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm originally from um, Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, um, and I highly rep my Habesha culture. Um, I'm super, super into all things cultural um, because of that. Um, but I moved pretty early on in my life to the U.S. Um, and where me and my family all became citizens. Um, and so I also rep you, the U.S., of course. Um, we live in Alexandria, Virginia, which is like the Nova area. Um, if you're from there, we call it the DMV, um, which people get confused sometimes. But um, it's a super cool place that's super diverse. Um, and I loved growing up there in high school. Um, I was kind of shy. I wasn't really that outgoing. I loved sports. I was sports obsessed. Um, but I'm more so kept to myself um, and just was focused on getting into college um, because like, you know, it would be a big relief for my family if I had gotten a scholarship. So I was kind of really focused on academics and um, trying to go ahead and do that. Um, and so luckily it worked out at Vandy with some awesome people. Um, nice. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. That's great. And I want to learn how you got the scholarship and how you were able to, to pay for school, because I know that's a big obstacle for so many people. Safa, you are coming to us from overseas right now. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm in the UK. Nice. Is that where you live or are you on a program? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm from the UK. I'm an international student at Vandy, so I'm just at home over summer. Nice. So, and they're going to, they're going to allow you to come back for the fall, given all the COVID stuff going on. Yeah. So with all that, um, there was a lot, a lot of stuff with like ice and, you know, the whole visa thing, uh, but I'm actually going to do a remote se semester next semester. So I'm going to stay in the UK, um, but I, I'm hopefully going to go back for spring. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that you're not going to be back because that stinks, right? Like you love being on campus, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just... You know, talking to my family and everything, it's just safer to be here. Well, everything's changing really quickly. So, Safa, let us into your world. Tell us a little bit about what it's like to go to high school in the UK, how you decided to come to go, go overseas to Vandy. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm from, like, a small town in northern England. Um, and, yeah, in high school, uh, you know, like, uh, most of the people who – you know graduate from my school go to like british universities like usually in the north of england to so, like liverpool manchester newcastle leeds um so in so uh, what what is this uh junior year i'm just trying to convert the yeah yes but in junior year um i applied for a mentorship program with fulbright which helps first gen low income students from the UK apply to colleges in the US. So I got accepted onto that. Um, and we had like a few workshops and like events in London. And we also had a summer school in the US. So after doing that program during junior year, I wanted to apply. So I applied um, senior year and then, uh, yeah. So that's nice. how I got to Vandy. Because I would think that if you are in the UK and you are going to school in the States, that you have to be rich. Yeah, so that's that's like most British students who go to university in the US are from private schools. And um, yeah, th they are usually rich. So the Fulbright program was to aim at, um, you know, the 
first gen low income students. So I have friends um, in my cohort because there was um, 150 people on the program each year. So I have friends like at universities across the US, um, but they're all universities that um, stay and provide full need aid to international students. Um, so that's why it's so that like I don't really know anybody at state schools really so it's usually um the private schools that can you know accept intel students and they'll provide the full aid that they need right that's amazing so I, I just love that if somebody has the dream of going to school in the states this is another path I mean I'm sure it's super competitive and difficult but you were able to to do it and how many people are in your cohort so it was 150. I think the amount of students that went to the US was 80. Other people decided to stay in the UK. Um, and then other people didn't apply to the US after doing the workshops and stuff. So it was really a, it was really a personal, optional thing. So like, I, you know, I would have been happy going to university in the UK. It's really just a different form of education, I'd say, between the UK and the US. Yeah. One's not better than the other. It's kind of just a different type of education. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So I love that you're here. And I think that's fascinating. And I have so many questions. Sean, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, tell me a little bit about you, where you grew up, uh, just so we can understand your background. Absolutely. I actually am one of the few at Vanderbilt, born and raised in Nashville. I joke that I'm just a few streets down way too often than I should. Um, Went to John Overton High School, which was one of the, if not the most diverse high school in like the Metro Nashville system, which has been genuinely a transition of a time to go from there to Vanderbilt. Um, my, both of my parents are refugees from Kurdistan. And so I am constantly surrounded by that culture and kind of accepting, like bringing that into more everyday life and like being a lot more open with the fact that it's such a like small, small culture that so few folks know about, but being proud of it nonetheless. Yeah. I would imagine that there are people who embrace you and, and your culture. Then have you encountered people who don't understand or find it intimidating or just, you know, don't know how to react or respond? I'll be completely honest to my end. I luckily have not. A lot more folks are, it's been a lot more conversations of people being appreciative of me being so open about it to say that like it encourages them to also accept themselves a little bit more or it comes the opposite of, I don't know where Kurdistan is because Kurdistan itself does have like a physical country. It is technically a territory within four countries right now. Um, and like getting to talk with them about the history of like where my people came from and kind of like what I grew up on and like getting to educate folks a little bit more. So when somebody has a question about that and they don't want to offend you or they want to ask in a way, you know, how can they use their curiosity as a way to engage you in a way that's comfortable and uh, safe. I will be honest, the boundaries I have are a lot looser than most folks because I work in advocacy myself. And so I have gotten the wide range of responses from the work I've done there. Um, so many times I will always assume the best to say like, hey, that might not be how you wanna word that, but I'm, like, I'm gonna assume it's good intentions and explain it anyway. But the genuine advice I've had, I would have for folks if they are trying to ask questions like that to anyone is there should not be any like accusatory ordeals. One of the best examples was one I actually had a meeting about right before this, um, where a newspaper locally had asked my boss basically, why do Muslims try to like move, come to Nashville and live in Nashville um, or come to Tennessee, which kind of targets to say like, it divides the people to say there's the Muslims in Tennessee and then there's the Tennessee. Try to make sure that like it's not kind of separating people out or accusing people of anything and also just nothing derogatory. Yeah. I don't just kind of question to say like, oh, hey, this is something that I'm wondering about and kind of say it in a like rude way. Sometimes you can just inquire and say, oh, can you explain this general topic to me instead? Right. So that person who was talking about Muslims coming to Nashville, uh, what would be a better way for someone to ask that question? It, like, the question itself was, like, why do Muslims come to Tennessee to live? Or yeah. moreover, could have been, like, reframed in the sense of, like, how has the community of, like, how has the community built itself within Tennessee? So, like, yeah. kind of saying, 
verging it from, oh, hey, you guys are two different groups to you guys are a part of Tennessee, but how has it grown within this like overall system? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we live in a time where it's so hard to engage and to do it safely. I mean, even before we started this discussion, I said, if I say something the wrong way, please let me know, you know, because like, I just want us to talk. And I think that that gets in the way of, of people engaging because we're so afraid. And I love that you make it so safe for people to say the wrong thing and, and not have it be a personal attack. It's more like, I'm going to help you to understand the way to talk to me because I know you have good intention, good intentions, which is, which is really, uh, you know, really wonderful. And, and, and I just think it's so powerful. Uh, one more question. Did you, were you born in the United States or did you come with your parents uh, when they moved? I was born in the United States. You were born here, but your parents were refugees and came here really not knowing anyone for the most part, or did they have family here? They came in cohorts. So um, basically presidency at the time would choose about 20 folks and like help them kind of go through the process from there to Guam to the United States. And so they were surrounded by other Kurdish folks and kind of a majority of everyone con- like conglomerated in Nashville. So like everyone knew each other in the city. Yeah, that's really, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there's so many different topics and so many roads that we can go down, but I want to stay focused on Vanderbilt and how you all arrived at Vanderbilt. Toby, you're so patient sitting there in, I think you're in New York City, right? I'm actually in Georgia right now. You're in Georgia? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, it's so funny because you're from New York, right? Yes, I am from New York. I'm in Georgia. I was like, Okay, sorry to interrupt you, but the background, I loved your background. I'm like, oh, it looks like we're in some kind of neighborhood. So in New York is the size of a shoebox. It looks nothing like this. <laughs> cool. So you're in, you're in uh, Georgia right now. And how did you end up in Georgia right now? Oh, I'm just visiting a friend. I booked this a really long time ago, but I'm glad it actually ended up happening. Nice. I'm so glad to hear that. So you are from New York City. You're actually, you know, live in New York when you're not in Georgia. So tell me a little bit about your experience at, you went to what high school again? I went to the Heschel High School. Um, it's on the Upper West Side. It's a Jewish school. Um, it was a very interesting experience. A lot of really rich kids who really like talking and flaunting about their money. So that was um, a fun opportunity to um, learn a lot more, a lot more about kind of who I am and what kind of a college I wanted to go to and the kind of people I wanted to surround myself with. So um, learning about the, yeah. So you come from a community where you're a first gen student, but you don't come from um, so much, so much of that wealth that you were surrounded by. Yeah. So I've been surrounded by wealth um, pretty often since living in New York, going to private school in the city um, that was covered substantially by scholarships as well as well in high school. And now going to, um, Vanderbilt is also pretty predominantly wealthy students. Um, a lot of kind of wealthy vibes, like a lot of people flaunt their money, a lot of um, just generally being surrounded by this concept of materialistically and things like that. So um, I think that's definitely been a large part of my understanding and my growing up and kind of navigating my how I fit into like understanding and recognizing that different reality. Yeah, it sounds like that that has had an impact and impact and uh been a theme throughout your experience so it'll be it'll be fun to learn how you're able to adjust and find your way because you all found each other you're all friends right like how why are you all together well how did this beautiful thing happen uh how did you how did you form friendships all of you i think we all met through first vu which is an organization that uh, me and toby are on the board of um which kind of caters to first generation students on campus. Um, and so like um, Shun has kind of worked with us in collaboration and Shun's in uh, Vanderbilt student government um, and has a number of other positions. And also she's just like such a huge advocate um, and we love working with her. And then Safa just came on board as well. Um, and so we're just kind of, I think we all just kind of originated from that having our first generation identity kind of brought us together yeah and you found each other and i could tell when you talk about each other you get happy you know it's like (laughs) happy vibes fill fill the air that's really great so batanya i would love to know how you how you ended up at vandy i want to understand the application process Um, i want to understand 
the financial piece. I want to understand all the things that you were able to overcome to now be a leader on campus. Because I imagine it wasn't as easy as just filling out one form and checking a box. Right. Yeah, it's not easy. Um, in terms of the application process, I actually got to visit a bunch of colleges through this program called the College Partnership Program. Um, they kind of had a tour, and so we got to visit a ton of colleges, and I went on it to visit Vandy because I had heard good things, but I kind of wanted to see the vibe on campus, um, and I loved it. Um, as soon as I got there. Um, so it was kind of pretty dead set that I was going to apply there. It was actually one of my top schools. Um, I'm also a QuestBridge scholar. And so that's a scholarship kind of national program where um, they have a national match program where you can list schools and uh, rank them in terms of um, which ones you prefer and do not prefer. And if you match, um, you essentially get a full ride to that school. It's really great for all first gen low income students um, who need that boost. Um, I actually did not match, but I just did early decision right after it um, and gone to Vandy through there. Um, and then in terms of like money, um, Vandy has this program called Opportunity Vanderbilt, um, which essentially covers your, if you have a, if you need aid to go to school, it essentially covers that for you in the form of a scholarship that Vanderbilt gives you. Um, and so that pretty much covered my costs to go to school. So it, it was a no brainer really um, working out because the way everything kind of fit together, um, that's kind of how I ended up there. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And you, so you get full a full ride, room and board, tuition. Right, all that. yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's incredible. That's like a value of what, 70 plus thousand dollars a year, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's a lot of students who, who fall under low-income first-gen category who sometimes want to keep that a secret or don't feel really proud of that. Um, right. You know, what I've learned is the louder and prouder you are, the more you can get. <laughs> if, you're, if you're like an achiever and focused, would you say that's true? Yeah, no, definitely 100%. I feel like also... Um, if you learn a little bit more about first gen and low income, it's actually, um, it's kind of like impressive, you know what I mean? To go through this college process, to kind of figure it out on your own and get into these same schools that people who've had tons of help um, also get into. Um, so it's more than just being proud of just being first gen low income, all the work that's attached to it is what your pride should come from. Um, and there's a lot there that I think um, people miss when they think of first generation low income. A lot of people think of the, uh, the difficulties associated and yes there are difficulties but that just makes the accomplishments that much more um, awesome and I feel like when you share that with people um, generally the reaction is pretty good at least in our group it's been pretty good um, and it kind of um, just shows people that you've had to work maybe a little bit harder um, so that's never really a bad thing to show people right yeah well thanks for sh I, I love hearing that um, when I work with first gen students, I'm always just blown away because like what you do and how you do it without having as much support oftentimes from the people closest to you. And so many questions where there aren't answers, you have to be really great at going after the answers. And that means being vulnerable. Right. So it's really scary to say, I don't know. Uh, but when you do that, you build these incredible relationships. There's so many questions. Um, I just want to know, you got into Vandy. Where else did you apply and did you get rejected from other schools? Because we love talking about rejection here. <laughs> yeah, so I applied to 22 different schools, actually. <laughs> like, I went crazy with it, which actually is not uncommon with first-gen students. Like, you apply everywhere because you want to make sure you get in somewhere, kind of the thing. Um, but, like, because I applied ED to Vandy, once I got my acceptance, um, I rescinded my application for all those schools. So I didn't actually really hear from many. Um, I think I got rejected from Brown and, and I think everything else was kind of like a bit too early right. <laughs> to hear back. They didn't have a chance to reject you. <laughs> exactly. Like, I've been accepted, I got it. Doesn't matter if you want me or not. 
uh, I'm going. That's that's right. that's fantastic, Safa. So tell me about your experience. I know that you said you said that you were placed or you were certain schools that you could go to through your scholarship program. But just walk us through that process if you're a, a student who's in the UK who aspires to go to a school in the states. Yeah. So like I said, there's only a few not a few, but I'd say about 80 schools in the U.S. that can commit to providing international students full aid if they need it. Um, So in that sense, like I was, um, you know, when I was like 15, I was like, oh, I, you know, applying to the U.S. would be pretty cool. Um, You know, like I liked the fact that you can have like multiple majors and like it's kind of a longer course, whereas in the U.K. it's kind of like, it's a three-year course and you can't switch your major it's like just a set course like when you apply for university in the UK like there'll be a website of like the course and it'll say what you're going to do every year um so if you want to change that you essentially have to drop out of crazy and then restart um the process so I liked the fact that US was very flexible um so in that sense like like I said like I know a lot of other students at colleges in the US um so it's usually like uh like the private schools that can provide the aid as well as like small you know private liberal arts colleges I think the only part the public schools we have is UNC and UVA through their scholarship programs right um so yeah was it super competitive to uh to get this scholarship or did not a lot of people apply you know, like how 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 what's your academic profile and the- so the so the fulbright mentorship program um so that i think had like a thousand applicants my year and 150 kids got in um so when you're on that program you know you have workshops and they take you into some summer school so that's all funded um and they ask you you know if you want to apply um so when you apply it's it's not it's not really fulbright pay, paying for your education it's them mentoring you and assisting you on you know um like how not how to get in but help on your applications um advice tips like you know um e, oh, most students get in through ed and ed2 because the acceptance rate is you know often higher and also the so most schools I think only Princeton and Harvard don't have this rule so for international students aid there's like a set budget um so it's not unlimited and it's need aware so that when you apply they look at the amount of money that you would need so in my case you know like a full ride so when you apply they look at the amount you need before they decide to admit you, which is different from uh, American students because they don't consider your financial needs. So that's also like part of the strategy thing. Right. Um, right. So you have to be super smart with where you apply and, you know, make sure that like, obviously that college can fund you. So that's the most important thing. Yeah. Because you, you didn't get to visit the schools. You are just looking at them through a website, right? Yeah, so with Vandy, I didn't visit. So my summer school, which was the summer before senior year, um, we visited like Bowdoin, Smith, Amherst, Harvard, MIT, Tufts. So we were like based in Boston area. Um, So that's the schools I got to see. So you still get like a sense of like, you know, a US education, but like, obviously I didn't get to see Vandy before I applied. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's mainly through a website, um, like virtual college fair stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, that's wild. And now you are part of the Vanderbilt Multicultural Leadership Council. You're an executive board member. You're the co-chair for international students on Vanderbilt student government. Uh, and also first VU. So you've really thrown yourself into life on campus. And uh, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, Toby, I'd love to know about your experience getting in, choosing Vandy. Was that easy? Was it hard? 
Um, it was definitely hard. My parents actually decided to get me a um, college admissions assistant person thing. Um, it was part of their, I don't know what I'm doing here and I feel really overwhelmed and my anxiety that was so deep that I was so overwhelmed about the ACT and what should I be doing with my time generally. So I was just like really just not knowing what I was doing. My college counselors were helpful at school, um, but very much overworked. Um, so having outside help was definitely a plus there. She kind of walked me through the application, walked me through um, the kind of tutoring that I should be getting, how I should highlight different parts of my resume. I also applied to Vandy ED. Um, I was obsessed with the place. I literally loved it so much. I'm a child development major, and Vandy's Peabody School is pretty unique in its specific accol accolades and just the way in which it um, just a uh, the way that it teaches and the professors that it has and the fact that it does research within such a small community. So I was really set on Vandy really early. Um, my ACT score was not high enough. I got a 33 on the ACT. That was not something I was excited about. I stressed about that for months. Mm -hmm. And then I was just constantly working on um, freshman year. I had mostly Bs in high school. So I just was constantly working on what can I do to make my application better. And I honestly think that why I got into Vandy was because of my college essay. I wrote about kind of the transition from being a, an extremely Orthodox Jew and the Orthodox background my family came up with and that brings me into being a first generation student. And the reason why I'm going to be going into child development and kind of tying these two um, really unique parts of myself within my essay made me a strong applicant, I believe. Definitely wasn't my ACT scores, probably wasn't my GPA. So I think having um, something to tell the admissions committee is definitely how I um, worked my way into Vandy. And also having help from outside of school was 100%. Lots of lots of help entirely based on that. I don't know how I would have done without it. And I commend these beautiful ladies for doing it that way. I just so overwhelmed yeah. so quickly. <laughs> yeah. The help, I, I mean, there's a common thread of everybody has some sort of help. I know, Batanya, you were talking about the different uh, scholarship or organizations and or the, the programs. I know, Safa, you mentioned that as well. And then, Toby, you found somebody. If, if there's somebody who wants to get additional help, I mean, is it really expensive to get somebody to help you to do that? Because I know you were talking about how, you know, that the, 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 the you know, having those resources can be really hard. So, you know, just curious if somebody wants to know, like, wow, I really could use that help. Is that affordable? Um, it was definitely affordable for my family. We also worked with someone that we know pretty closely. And okay. it was, um, I would say, like, friends and family discount type thing. I don't okay. know really how much they cost. I would assume right. that at every price point, kind of, um, like most commodities. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I hear these things, I always think if there's somebody who's listening and somebody who wants to do what you're doing, what are those obstacles? And just that idea of if there's somebody who's uh, a private consultant or somebody who helps people on the side, uh, just asking them, you know, seeing if they can help you. Uh, and the worst thing that they'll say is I can't, or they'll be able to give you some information that would be like an a la carte type of service. Um, yeah. But it sounds like Toby, you were like really wanted Vandy. Your heart and soul was set on Vandy. If you didn't get in, what would you have done? I mean, I'm like, I can't even imagine. Um, I actually, I got into Tulane. I applied, um, early action I think it's what they called it um and I got a pretty solid scholarship there so I would have been able to done that but everywhere else I didn't hear back from so right and you worked your way in and then are you still orthodox no I'm not religious or anything okay so it was that transition of being orthodox no longer uh, identifying and sharing something very vulnerable and personal as part of your essay sounds like a great essay I would love to read your essay um <laughs> really I can see your essay. Wow, that sounds really cool. It's, I mean, it's. I show it to so many people. I'm really proud of that. And now I'm yeah. applying to law school, so I'm stressing about writing my personal statement and reviewing yeah. these things is really helpful. Oh, well, you could even ride the. I wrote this other essay. You could share the, the impact of the other essay and how people have responded to that as part of your personal statement for law school. It's like, why not? you know, get the most out of it, right? It's like, you know, it is. It's because I bet it sparks a lot of really interesting conversation of people who face this inner conflict of how do I reconcile my family's identity and, and tradition versus what is it that I want for me? And I think a lot of first-gen students, I find this a lot, is that your cultural ties are so wonderful and they are, are so, uh, they, they serve a wonderful purpose in anchoring you. Um, but then at the same time, some people feel weighed down or they have to carry the weight of their culture with them. So a failure or a stumble isn't just about their own uh, imperfection, it becomes 
something heightened because everything's riding on you, you know? And I, and I think that's a really scary thing and being part of First VU is really wonderful because you all have each other and you can also focus on what is it that I want. So Toby, if you want to use this stuff for your, uh, this could be a good beginning of the law school one. Like, I, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like how do you reconcile yeah. that? So Sean, you've been really wonderful. You're patient. I love hearing all these stories and thank you for for being so patient. And if any of you have anything to interject about what other people are sharing, like just fire away because you know I love interrupting people and you can too. So Sean, tell me a little bit about your experience getting into Vandy, just like going to school down the street. I'm curious if you, if you lived on campus. I'm curious like how being a local student also impacted you. But like first, how do you even get in? So I will say my situation was a little, really interesting one. I mainly applied to state schools like MTSU, TSU, UT Knoxville, um, because that was the reality for a lot of the students I was surrounded with. Um, now our public school, the year I left, our public, like, the school I went to got a lot more funding and like sent a lot more kids to like Yale and Harvard and Brown. But the year I graduated, a majority either went to MTSU, UT Knoxville or the military. Um, Vanderbilt was a surprise to many. Um, and I'll be honest, the, like I lit up, I lit up because like, the, uh, I heard 22 schools and I think I applied to four um, cool. and that two of them were by force. Um, amidst all of that though, I will say the process was I had, I knew I had to stay in the state. Both of my parents are older and also being a part, like both being refugees and like being home and dependent on me to like keep all the things in check. I knew that I'd probably have to stay in Asheville. I applied to one or two that I was just kind of interested in seeing if I get in, did not get in. Um, and that's completely okay. Um, but amidst it, I was expecting to probably go to MTSU and then the Vanderbilt acceptance came in and that was a really cool day. And I told my dad and my mom and they were celebrating cause they always joke that when they came, um, the route from the airport to our house is literally right under the Vandy bridge. And my mom would go and be like, I'm going to have a child walk through that bridge. Now I do. I will say amidst being a local student, it's not too much different. I enjoy being the city away from the city. Like the way I explain Nashville to a lot of folks is that you have center Nashville, like downtown Nashville, which is about where Vandy is. You have north, south, east, and west. I myself am from South Nashville, and each kind of area is this whole entire different city. South Nashville is like a majority minority, like ethnic community. North Nashville is a lot of like the rich suburbs. Um, east and west each have their own kind of style to them. It's really nice to be able to have the break from, I guess, my part of the city to say like, I grew up here. Now I'm in this part of the city, which is completely brand new to me. But whenever this gets overwhelming, I can go back to what I once knew and like definitely took advantage of coming home and like keeping up with my parents, my little sister, and just kind of like balancing between the two lives. Yeah. The first, oh, sorry. No, no, I, please continue. The first two years I lived on campus because it was one of those things where like I'm a, I knew I probably would not get like it was an opportunity I wanted to at least experience, even though if it was only for half a half a like college experience. Um, this year, though, I decided to commute back and forth now, just because I some stuff occurred and I just needed to be home to make sure things kind of like got adjusted in, in a timely manner. Yeah, how's that work when you're so you're you're such a important part of your family structure? You know, are you able to? Are you able to do for you? How do you balance that and still have a fulfilling life on campus? She's amazing. That's how she does it. But also <laughs> answer the question, sorry. <laughs> I will say I learned the hard way of overstretching myself my freshman year, completely like breaking down at one point and realizing I gotta learn some time management at some point. And so like 360 that, talk to, um, a bunch of resources on campus. I will not stop ranting about the CSW and how they literally taught me to go from overwhelmed to, oh, I can actually balance like these 27 things at the same time. What's, because, this, what's the CSW? Uh, the Center of Student Wellbeing. It's a uh, like office on campus that is not the, our universal counseling center, so it's not much of a mental health area. It's just more over like a physical, if you're struggling to learn how to study and if you're struggling to like keep up with everything. And I definitely utilized it because I went from a public school that I did not study at all for to um, like a private institution. And like the transition with that was horrible. Um, that I'm just 
plus the support of friends. Uh, like I will say like the three women on here, plus so many other folks, like whenever I'm at a point where it's like, I can't do this, I am like so freely able to call someone and say like, hi, I need help. And the Vanderbilt community, and like the one strange thing about how it functions more than other universities is so many more folks are so willing to jump in and say, oh yeah, I'll do it. And it like, that was kind of what got me this year and like being able to figure out what I, like how I work. And then now I've kind of figured out like, okay, this is the transition of these times I come home and fix this while these times I'm in student government doing this while these times I'm in the lab doing this. Right. And then now you're, you're back at home um, helping out with some of those other issues. And just so people have context, so you're a computer engineer, which sounds pretty easy. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's like intense stuff, uh, especially I'm sure at Vandy, with a minor in engineering management and theater. I love that there's the theater piece too. And then you are the student body vice president. You're in Vanderbilt off-Broadway, the technical director, build crew. You do community outreach, Vanderbilt, hustler, multimedia journalist, uh, Strike Magazine as a staff photographer. And you are also involved with doing some outside work, some freelance work for some international showcases. So, and then you, and you also are at home uh, helping your parents to navigate life. And I'm sure, you know, do they speak uh, English well? They do. Okay. Um, it's a lot of the times like some minor stuff of just things. The reason I became an engineer is things would break down and I'd be like, hey, Sean, go fix it. And so yeah. our extended spring break was quite legitimately, I turned, like, I just completely fixed her upstairs to be like, okay, this would need to happen. Now I have about four weeks to go about it. <laughs> Well, you did not include that you do um, contracting and <laughs> <laughs> you really do. You really do do it all. But um, I know that there's my uh, my sister-in-law is uh, came, came from Israel and her parents didn't speak English very well. And she throughout her, you know, young adult life was very involved with family affairs, translating uh, connecting them with people who could help them. So she had this very different role that is uh, a role that I think a lot of people don't understand, but then you're able to um, to balance everything. Um, getting help. Uh, Toby, how are you at getting help? Are you good at asking for help? Asking for help? Yes. I have all of these amazing helpers here. The first of you, we have an incredible exact board. In terms of generally, on-campus resources are really, really great. I kind of use them to the max. I have my schedule planned out and most of it is with other people, mostly them helping me or me helping them. So I definitely take advantage of any help options and opportunities. Um, for examples about things on our campus that I use for help, you can think about the writing center, the tutoring center, the career center, the um, the UCC is a the therapy or like counseling center. It's really great on our campus. There's just so many incredible opportunities. Vandy just started this new thing called the Campus Connector, and I haven't spoken to her yet, but I'm excited about working with that. I think it's just another resource to direct you to the resources. So Vandy's really just there for you to help see what you can do and how you can find these ways. But um, getting the help is definitely something that I'm more than happy to do, especially because everyone at Vandy is so smart. Everyone who's there is doing is there for a reason. They have their purpose. They have what they want to do. So asking them for help, and or like recognize that they want help is exciting because it's like an opportunity for those two of you to continue to grow and work towards a new goal so realizing other people's goals and helping them or having getting help to get to the goals with the people themselves is i think really cool i think the people that help you the most like the resource center is definitely 100 percent. they're always willing to help and um I don't think enough people utilize them, but I think the people that have helped me the most are definitely the other students. Um, because like this, no one knows the ins and outs of Vandy more than the students that have had to navigate it for the past four years. And like, um, no one knows like if you have a bad professor, how exactly to appease that person, or if you're going through an administrative process, which is a little annoying or challenging, or you're not hearing back, they're the ones who know who to contact and like um, what to say to get a get the response that you want. So like I think the Vandy students um, are definitely like very helpful. Um, so getting to know each other is like a big thing. I think that's scary though when you're so smart and you're used to doing so well. 
and then you get to a new place where you're around so many people who are so smart and used to doing so well, um, asking for help without worrying that people are going to think you're not good enough. Um, you know, asking for help and being vulnerable when you have a professor who is so knowledgeable and has such a great reputation. You know, how do you ask for help when you are in this new situation and you're trying to prove yourself and don't have a long family history of, you know, knowing that you can do that? Is that something that anybody struggled with or struggles with currently? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Safa, uh, definitely, yeah, like, so I just finished my freshman year and first semester, like, I struggled a lot, like, you know, trying to do too much, like, trying to, you know, be on the same position as my peers, you know, who weren't dealing with, like, you know, a culture shock, like, they weren't first gen students, they didn't have, you know, any, like, family or, like, income issues, um, so that was, like, a really, like, big thing trying to do a lot like first semester and trying to prove myself but I think like you know like the UCC like I always made sure I went to my weekly UCC appointment um as well just like um like just talking to students and like making friends who that who understand your issues but also reaching out to like offices again like you know uh like the career center um like your visions leader which is like a freshman program um to ease like settling in um so I always made to use offices even even if you know even if it was like a calm week and I had like no assignments I'd still you know go um to like the the tutoring center and like the student care office and stuff like that it sounds it sounds awesome I mean, it sounds like you're so supported you just have to open yourself up to be able to allow that into your life, which I, which I think is, is a really hard thing, which leads me to another question. Uh, the most uncomfortable experience, by a show of hands, how many of you have failed a quiz or exam or something? Have you failed a quiz or exam at one point in, during your college career? Safa, failed. Shun, failed. Patanya, failed. Toby, no failing? Ds? Do you get a D? No D? Not even a D. Wow, look at you. It's, it's, no, I'm going to chalk that one up to all the help I got. Okay. okay. So it's, not that you're, it's that you're great at asking help before you need it. Sure. Yeah, because I'm good at that too, but I fail all the time. It's like one of my gifts. Is uh, I do everything wrong usually twice, and then I'm great doing it a third time. I have kids, and when we used to get like stuff to put together, toys, I would never – I would never make it real tight at first because I knew I'd have to take it apart two or three times because like something would be backwards. I was like, how do you sit when this eats the other way? Um, okay, so let's I see have, who... Sorry, yeah. I, have to interrupt you. I have to leave in two minutes. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to talk about a few first VU resources if that's possible. And I'd also like happy to reschedule this for another time to finish the conversation because I feel like we have a lot more to say um, or especially if it's getting edited, but I do just, I have to make this call at one. Okay, yeah, awesome, yeah. So, so Toby's got to gotta duck out. So wrap things up for you from, from uh, what First VU can do and just any, anything else you want to share while you're here with us. Awesome, thank you so much. I'll do this quickly. Thank you so much for everyone who's watching. Um, there's a few things that we should say and will be said and everything. The first thing is that it's not impossible, you can do it. And we're here to help, so just message us and show our contact information. Everything is there. We want you to come here. We want you to enjoy it. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be fun. But just think of this as something that's an opportunity for you. It's not, doesn't, it's not, it's an opportunity for everyone, okay? Don't think this doesn't belong to you. We're talking directly to you. If you're looking at the screen, I'm talking to you. So please just think about this as an option. And First View has a ton of resources about this. We have a new website that Shen has been helping to develop and everyone here has been helping to create content for um, that's going to be coming up in the next few weeks. We have a, um, I forgot what it's, the official title is, but it's basically a compiled Google Doc of all ways to save money and have a really fun time at Vanderbilt while in Nashville. So things to do around the city and saving money while you do that. First View generally has a lot of events and meetings and other just um, really cool ways to connect, empower, and strengthen first-generation students. So if you are a first-generation student thinking about or looking to come to Vanderbilt, to Vanderbilt, definitely look into First VU. Reach out to us. We're here to help. And, yeah, definitely talk to us. We're so excited to you're considering us. Okay, cool. Thanks, Thank you so much, Harlan. I really have to go, but I really appreciate everything. And just let me know if I can help in any other way, okay? Absolutely. Thanks, Toby. Awesome. Great to be here. Bye, Thanks. guys. All right. It's like on fast forward. <laughs>
I right. You, you could slow that one down if you need to to like half speed if you want to if you want to listen to it all. But um, I love I love her intensity and I love that you all love what you do and you really truly have your heart and soul into wanting support, wanting to support other students. And it's not just students who are first gen students; it's really any student, right? So just if if somebody's thinking about this and thinking, "Gosh, I want to connect with people who are from different backgrounds." Uh, then this is a wonderful way, or just connect with with kind-hearted people who really are genuinely motivated by helping others to do well. All right, so let's dig into a little bit of the dirt. I want to know what your most uncomfortable experience was and how you got through it. I can go first. Um, I think my most uncomfortable experience was um, acting as a research assistant. Um, so I was I was a research assistant for um, someone in the political science department, um, and I'm not going to name names or anything, but it ended very very horribly. Um, and the reason was that um, I had sent an email that began with "Hey" instead of "Hello," um, and so that kind of burst into a bigger issue um, where the this person felt disrespected, um, and so like. I tried to patch it up, obviously, like we met um, and I apologized um, and said that I would refer to every email starting with hello from now on. Um, but the person just felt very, very disrespected by the hey. Um, <laughs> and so um, it just became a situation where they felt undermined in their position. Um, and so it just wasn't a good environment anymore. Um, so we, we part ways, we parted ways, um, but it was just very awkward and very, it very much shot my confidence um, because I did not realize it was gonna go that way. I thought it was kind of like an issue we would resolve and move on to, um, but like, um, just kind of being aware that some professors or some um, people in departments um, may have tics or there's certain things that like set them off a lot more than you know of and it's not really your fault, it's not on you, um, it would be really, really helpful, I think, um, just because I was very shocked and it wasn't until later after going over it with my friends that I was like, why, why would they ever react like that? It's not that big of a deal. Um, but like at the end of the day, it might have been something going on with them. And I just don't think it had anything to do with me. And understanding that has helped me regain my confidence. So just understanding that some people might be um, have other things going on. It has nothing to do with you. And it might come out in a way that it seems like it does. Yeah, that's traumatic. What grade, what, what year in school did this happen? I was a junior. So thank yeah. God I had a couple of years. If I was a freshman, that would have been horrible, right. horrible. And you had people to turn to, like when that all went down, you had yeah, a Yeah, my friends. I like went to the Black Cultural Center um, and a lot of people kind of just hang out there at times. Um, and I was like, so this just happened. Well, what do you guys think about this situation? And I didn't frame it in any way. And they were like, why would they ever disrespect you like that? And I was like, you know, that's what I was thinking. But then like the way they were reacting, I was questioning myself. Right. <laughs> Don't question yourself. You probably are right. Confirm it. But like, again, like it might have nothing to do with you. So like there is only so much you can do. Yeah. That reminds me of the expression. If someone, if, if it's hysterical, it's historical that it's not a right-sized reaction and somebody who has that hysterical reaction, it's really something that's rooted in some history that has nothing to do with you, uh, but something right. entirely to do with them because anyone who would hang on to that and not let that just fall behind them is, right. is clearly dealing with stuff. And I think that's a really right. scary thing. Um, thank goodness you were a junior because if you're a first year student, you wouldn't have your people, you wouldn't have your places necessarily. And then you have someone who just rocks you to the core, which makes you question like, am I good enough? Is this the right place for me? But you just met someone who was dealing with stuff. I mean, that's just that's just, I had someone, I, was, I interned at The Tonight Show one summer um, years ago. And one of the writers, like I met this writer who was awesome and shared with me that he wrote an advice column and it really changed the trajectory of my career because I started writing advice in college. But this one writer's like, Harlan, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, I will never like you. And I was what? like, oh my gosh, like, 
because I would yeah, talk to people. Yeah, at that point, like, you just got to let it roll off your back. Like. I was like, oh my, I mean, I'm like such, I like to be liked. And maybe he didn't, maybe that bothered him that I like, like to be liked, but I wanted to learn from the writers. So I asked, you know, I'd ask people about their job and this dude just flipped out. And it was, um, I want you to talk because I always, I don't like to talk during this because I have you, but there's this thing called the universal rejection truth. And it's like a law of nature. The universal rejection truth says not everyone and everything is going to respond to me the way I always want everyone and everything to respond. And knowing this law is really amazing because it liberates you when you encounter discomfort instead of internalizing it and going, oh, I'm the problem or saying someone else is the problem. We can let the universal rejection truth be that thing and allow it to just be in the universe without having to resolve it. You know, there are just things in our life that we have to recognize and not everyone and everything is going to always respond to us. I think especially from what I've seen, so many students who come from difficult backgrounds, you know, they don't necessarily like the background they're from. As a, as a woman, I mean, you're rejected before you even speak. You know, as, as, a, as a minority, uh, people are already judging you before you even walk or talk. Like, it's craziness. So this truth is, is in the universe, and it's been really helpful for me. And I see it all the time where when I meet with really strong students, it's like, you know, some people just aren't going to, they're just not going to get it. And I give them permission. And I just move forward. I charge forward and people get, then people get it. All right, enough about me talking. Safa, what do you think? What about your most uncomfortable experience and how did you get through it? Um, I mean, we already talked like academic wise. Um, like first semester, I didn't do well on two classes. So I'm how reading poorly did you do? Just like really bad. Like, <laughs> um, you know, so I'm going to retake those um, I think one in spring and then one junior fall. Right. Um, so after that, I, um, you know, that's just awful. But also another one. Um, so I was just sat in my dorm room lobby, like do my homework because, you know, like that's a place to do your homework. And there's a group of students, um, obviously I'm not going to say names, but they, you know, they, they're, they're a group of students, so they came up to me. And I was on the phone to my friend at the time uh, back home. So I was like, you know, talking to her and they were like, oh, um, what's your name? I was like, oh, I'm Safa. Like the people came up to me. They're like, oh, like where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from like near Manchester in the UK, like England. And they're like, oh, are you like really English? Because you don't look English. Like you're brown. Like that was so uncomfortable to me, especially because they were also minorities. Um so that was just really uncomfortable. Um, when someone says that, I mean, are you? What are you thinking? What goes through your mind? It's just like I don't. I don't know what they'd expect. Like someone, like who looks like Prince William, just like talking really posh. Like I don't understand what they want when they say someone's from the UK. Um, but it was just kind of like I don't. I. I don't know whether it was like just straight up like racism or just like ignorant to the fact there's immigrants in other countries. Um, but yeah, that was just because especially it was in like the first two weeks of college, like I was still homesick and stuff. Right. So. Well, it's got to be ignorance because anybody who knows anything about the UK knows that there are so many different cultures and it's such a diverse, I mean, it's, it's, it, how diverse is it like it's crazy right yeah like i mean for my town i live in like a super white conservative town so the transition to nashville was actually really really nice okay. and dandy um but in cities like in like manchester or london or like edinburgh like super diverse right that's you know, i mean they colonize like half the world so <laughs> right they, it's just total it's total ignorance when somebody makes a comment like that um and then i have one more question about the the grade piece because you know you are exceptional and you were able to get this incredible scholarship and then you arrive in this campus and two of your classes you really struggle with those was there someone who helped you to recognize that you you know that you deserve to be there and that you you are good enough and that this is normal um, I'm actually going to shout out Shun here because she helped me a lot. Um, 
because uh, they were both classes like required in the school of engineering so i'm like a computer science and poli sci major now but before then i was mechanical engineering so i'll say like students as well like just like shouldn't help me a lot um and then my fellow people like in those classes like lana she's one of my closest friends um just like recognizing that even though you can struggle in those classes especially like vanderbilt engineering is just known for being like notoriously like really hard i think like the average gpa is like 2.5 i want to say like in the school of engineering so that like they want you to yeah. fail my best friend's yeah, also they, in engineering like, she, the average she, like, she, she, like it's you know vandy engineering is just not you know it's really hard so i think that's one thing that made me realize because we we have grade deflation i want to say like so that's like a really you know that's a really annoying thing about vandy but um and it can be really demotivating when other people are doing like you know majors considered to be like easier um so and they'll be getting like 4.0s and they're just there like doing really bad in your engineering classes but um but I think like students and like also one of my one of the classes for that the professor was super nice she was like you know my first semester I didn't do well on the class that I'm teaching now but you know like I kept going and now I'm a math professor at Randy um so that was like a really you know like and also just the UCC like the the therapist I had like she was um you know I talked to her about personal stuff also academic stuff and she was really like supportive yeah it sounds like the the UCC that's what you're saying is like an amazing resource that everyone should take advantage of. And it sounds like it's accessible. And there's, are, are there enough people there? Or are you always able to get seen? No, there's not enough people there. Okay. It That's generally good. has a long wait list. Yeah. So in addition to having your UCC, having your other communities to go along with that, um, to make sure you have your people in places so you can be supported. Sean, tell me about your most uncomfortable experience and, and how did you get through this? I want to I want to know you're such a leader and do so many great things. Let's, let's pull that curtain back considering you do so much behind the scenes. So let's pull it back and, and give us the real story. There's so much to start with. There's like, I, I will say overall, I'm very open with a lot of things. I will full say I failed two courses at one point, almost like dropped out of Vanderbilt came back now we're better um still on probation working on that should be done by next semester um yeah where do i begin um the most uncomfortable one has to be my spring semester freshman year where everything just went downhill this was a phone call from my mother one day saying hi said family members i will clarify more than one passed away in a week i'm flying back home this was a Thursday. She flew home the next day. Um, and so all of a sudden, my life was just unraveled. And so balancing that, plus this was the year I like, this was a semester I started like applying for leadership positions because I was like, this is something I could start trying to do. Um, that went horribly because now you have to balance these like technical director for a show, which is about 25 to 30 hours a week, um, plus working, plus actual engineering school. And as I said before, the school literally at this point, I believe, like, aspires to have students fail. There was one point in the semester I sat down in the middle of Feathering Hill and I just started bawling. Lucky enough for me, my material science professor walks out that exact moment and just sees me and just sits with me and starts conversing, like, first of all, calm, saying, like, oh, I should probably calm this, like, 5-5 five, five crying child in the middle of, like, Feathering Hill. But also just, like, hey, we have class in, like, 10 minutes. Like, do you want to talk and calm down and come to class? And I was like, sure. And I explained this to him. And, like, he kind of looks at me and he goes, you really did all of that in a semester and you're still here. And I was like, yep. And there's just so many tiny bits and pieces from these first two years. There comes um, this semester, I was at, I call it out of service. The first two weeks I had a lung um, collapse. And so that just took me out for a good chunk of the semester. There comes the VSG election of itself because we are a predominantly white institution. And Veer Shah, who's the president this year, you, now you're talking a double, like, POC, first generation. Um, he was HOD. I'm an engineer. So, like, I was one of the first engineers to be on, like, a VSG exec board. 
that was insane in and of itself because I'm someone who enjoys being behind the scenes and all of a sudden now it's like, hi, you're going to be the face of this. Um, there comes the like inquiries with professors and like trying to let them know, hi, I need help, but not help as in, like, oh, this one assignment, help in like trying to pass the class. It's, it's a lot to go back and forth on. Um, comes the summer freshman year, I lose a scholarship that like took a solid chunk out of my financial aid. And so trying to figure out how to balance that was a full time and a half. Um, Did you lose that because of your academics? Yes. Um, that semester took me down a significant amount. Yeah. And yet you continue to survive and not only survive, but continue to thrive. Thrive is one way to put it. I will say survive as of now, just because the one thing I will emphasize is that college is the time to give yourself grace. I will say there is a slight possibility I might have to extend a semester because I finally figured out what I wanted to do and how to go about it. What do you want to do? Um, I want to go into computer engineering, go into software design for nonprofits and businesses, the possible side gig of audio and visual engineering within um, the entertainment industry. So concerts, theater productions, okay. and construction and things like that. Nice. So you figure that out, which means it might take a little longer, which is fine. Uh, I, I live by the, the uh, expression, um, do something and something will happen. Uh, and when you do something, you discover. And I think that's, that's really a wonderful, a wonderful thing that you continue to do. Safa, I, I thought it was so interesting when you were talking about when you are in the UK looking at colleges and, and, and university that you have to pick a, a particular path. You know, it's like you're 18, 19, right? Yeah, I got to pick a path. And if I change that path, I got to start over again, which is like, yeah. Gotta, so, I, yeah. so I think a pro of it is that um, like for medicine, so if you want to do medicine in the UK, the two, the two ways you can do it is like a five-year straight degree when uh after high school <clears throat> or you can do like um you know either of science-based or non-science-based undergrad degree and then do graduate degree in medicine um for dentistry it's the same thing for nursing it's uh like a three-year undergrad degree obviously after all these degrees there's you know residency and further training or like a grad degree um, and then also there's this thing in the UK, I don't know if they exist in the US, but if you don't do well, too well in high school, um, there's this thing called foundation years. So, you know, uh, all universities have them like, you know, from like Oxford to Edinburgh to Manchester, like, so it's one year of kind of like, so you can have a, like a foundation year in like science or like uh, biological sciences or like, you know, computer science so depending on how well you do in that then you can either uh like transfer to another university or stay on um so i think that's a really good like inclusive way because in the uk like student finance like we don't really have um like so tuition is nine thousand pounds a year but for every single person in the uk it's um that's a loan from the government that you'd have to pay back until you earn like the average salary in the UK and it's like 5% of your income every month. Um, and th it's the same thing with like housing costs. Um, so it is like a different system, but um, you know, I like, I want to do a master's in the UK, um, but I really like that, like the undergraduate education Vanderbilt and the US provides. Right. And I don't think I'd be the same student in the US that I would have been in the UK. Yeah, you're going to come back and you're going to be like, it sounds like, this, it's almost like uh, academic boot camp at Vandy. You know, like they just push you, push you, push you, push you, push you. And then you, you leave and you're like, wow, I could do anything. You know, and maybe that's that's how, maybe that's the strategy. I just have a couple more questions. I'm really respectful of your time. And, and again, just so grateful that, that we can all be here. The most rewarding, the most wonderful, the experience you've had that just overflows, makes you overflow with joy. Uh, and you think, wow, I can't believe I did that. Uh, wow, that just really was just so incredibly rewarding. Is there something that, that comes to mind? It's one of two. First one was the spring of my freshman year. I got, I was Bill Crew for our like, fall show. And then I got a call to say, hey, would you like to be our director for the spring show? Um, and that was insane. Definitely not qualified at the time, but 
taking that all of like a sudden position and kind of learning from it. Consider it failure, but also success in the sense of I came to love the field entirely. And every time I think about like, everyone jokes about the show of like, oh, it was a whole mess, but I love that show so dearly because it created this whole life path for me right afterwards. The other being this campaign, um, I definitely was not thinking I was going to run this year. I was planning on running, I guess, my senior year, like this spring for a senior year position. Um, and then I had like a few folks reach out and say like, hey, run. And that was one of the best decisions of just kind of off a whim saying, this might be something I'll regret not taking later on. And now it's come to a lot of really cool projects that I legally cannot say quite yet. Um, but that will be done soon. And it will be really cool to see like that was my footprint on Vanderbilt's campus. Right. Because you won. You won. I did. First, first engineer is it, who's uh, on the executive board. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. One of the, uh, it's very uncommon for an engineer to get, like try to get a VSG position because it's so much harder to network with people. Yeah. And so I, that was one of the really cool ones of just being one of the first to be a part of that team. That's awesome. And also it's worth noting that it was after you had your breakdown your first year that you were offered this opportunity to manage the stage production and right. And then you, and then after, after working through that and, and if the word breakdown is too severe, you know, we can take that down or that, that moment where you were crying <laughs> and and dealing, crying uncontrollably dealing with life uh, maybe not uncontrollably anyway you're amazing just wanted to put that into context and toby had mentioned Sean that is totally incredible yeah 100 like, percent. honestly you should have run for president i would have voted for you i appreciate it so much yeah i can't emphasize enough that like vanderbilt's campus is an enigma in college like college campuses in the sense of there's your folks here and there and everywhere has the problematic sides of things. But I, the community here is one that will support you no matter what, as long as you have the best interest at heart of my initial thing coming here was I want to help people. I want to get my degree, but also make this something that is a possibility for others. Put that together and have come across some amazing folks like the women here and just other organizations who've all just been like a, hi, I want to make this a reality and getting to work with like so many different aspects just because one day over lunch, I just decided to say yes and go for this position. Yeah, that's so cool. That's so cool. Safa, your most uncomfortable, or I'm sorry, so, let's go. I'm sharing your, your most exciting overflow, pride, happy, joyful moment at Vandy. I say two things. So one thing, um, like first semester, I didn't do well at all and I was on probation um, academic probation and then second semester I raised my GPA by 1.0 and um, did well in like classes that like I thought I wouldn't and like you know just generally like feeling more secure um, as an academic at Vandy um, and I'd say another um, so I uh, so I I as I mentioned I'm on the multicultural leadership council so getting onto that was like really nice because i've kind of been involved in like a lot of cultural stuff on campus um so it'll be nice to help like international students moving forward and we did quite a lot for like um like sharing information about the ice regulations and like helping students out and i was personally like talking on group chats and stuff like that so i'm excited to get more involved in that um you know, like, I like that we have, you know, what a separate, like, exec board and, like, big org that, you know, moni like, helps out and has umbrella orgs under, like, the the multicultural, like, field. Um, and then also, I guess, another one is that this summer I've been working as a research assistant in the anthropology department. Um, not my major, but I just thought it was really interesting. So uh, I've been helping um, the professor research on, like, uh slave ships and plantations and stuff like that which has been really eye-opening yeah that sounds really cool you know Batania has some advice when corresponding with your professor <laughs> and sending research notes uh right yes yes <laughs> now right. use hey he might trigger someone <laughs> Batania, tell me about your most uh joyful you know rewarding experience um I, I think I have a tie. Um, 
And I think the first one that had happened was um, I was the founder of the Ethiopian Eritrean Student Association on campus. Um, and founding it was kind of a, a long journey. <laughs> um, um, so being able to create it and then getting at all these applications for a board of incredible people who really, really worked hard um, to make themselves like good candidates um, and seeing that blossom, like just having meetings where everyone's together and, you know, eating in Jera, which if you guys don't know is Ethiopian food, um, it's really, really good. And just like connecting back to our culture, even though we're not with our families and like um, being able to, we, we used to go to dinners in Nashville at an Ethiopian restaurant nearby. Um, and it would just be a bunch of us. We would take up the whole restaurant and like, um, it was just such a nice experience to channel that into like an organized thing at Vandy so that we can continue having it. Um, Cause we used to have that once a semester before um, and just so seeing the same people come out and like just have fun with each other, I think was, was a really nice moment for me. Just realizing that um, this, this community has a space now, like a really, um, good space. Um, and then I say, I'd say the second one was working with First VU um, and partnering with QuestBridge to um, advocate for refunds for first generation low income students. Um, so during COVID, um, there was a lot going on and no one was really getting any refunds for housing or anything like that. Eventually what came out was uh, Vanderbilt had a policy that would give out refunds based on how much money you paid in, um, meaning first generation low income students who are on scholarships were not getting the money. Um, and they were the ones most affected by COVID, right? Like their home situations, they were the ones that were suffering really. Um, so First VU and QuestBridge worked together, um, had a campaign, we had a petition with like, I believe over a thousand signatures. Um, we gathered data, we talked to administration um, and like worked really hard. Eventually what came out was that the federal government was giving out money for um, low income students on Pell Grants, which was essentially the majority of those that didn't get refunds. So it ended up working out. Um, and now we're partnering with the Office of Inclusive Excellence um, to kind of make campus more first generation and low income friendly because Clearly, you know, there's a lot of work to do here. Like Vanderbilt University, unfortunately, doesn't actually have a definition for first generation yet and doesn't have like um, programming the same way you can find at other schools. So just like being able to to work towards that, I think, yeah. is really, really cool. That's awesome. So First View is really, it sounds like a really strong org organization with a lot of support and clearly amazing leadership. And those are that, that's great. So you got the refunds, students got their money you were able to help them. Yeah, that's, that's remarkable and such great, such great, ah, such amazing work. Uh, I, I have one quick question and then another quick question. And I promise we're wrapping this up. Um, when we, when I share these with students, I like to emphasize places. Uh, places are so important and you've been able to demonstrate this. Can you rattle off real quickly your places where you found connection, community support, help, advocacy, all those things. So um, Tanya, just because it's fresh in your mind, just give me a quick speed round, rattle off your places at right. Vandy. Yeah, so East Ethiopian Eritrean Student Association, that club is incredible. Um, even if you aren't from the culture, we'll definitely take you in um, and make you honorary, it's awesome. Um, the first first view is great and especially after the whole COVID ordeal we're just closer than we were before even um so that's great um i'm also part of the national black law student association um and so for any law students um we work really hard to have um, events that target everyone and then specific events for black students as well um and then um i would say the bcc um, was my place for a very long time. There are some restrictions now um, in terms of when you can go in and stuff like that. Um, but the 
that place was definitely during like sophomore year was a place that a lot of people gathered um, to junior year as well. Um, and then the women's center as an intern there, um, I studied there almost every night last year um, and I would be bring, bringing my friends and it would just be like a really great time, um, even with other interns, stuff like that, um, definitely. And then a new addition is that ISA is going to be partnering with a national organization that we're helping create called ISANA, which is the Retrain Ethiopian Student Association of North America. So that's going to connect us to other ISAs across the world and some more regional to us. Um, and so hopefully we're going to have like regional meetups once COVID is passed, um, and that'll also be a good community. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing your places. Safa, tell me about your places at Vandy. Um, so yeah, I'll say Multicultural Egypt Council, uh, orgs under that as well, like the Muslim Student Association, um, South Asian Cultural Exchange. Uh, we had like a, a Bollywood, um, I did a Bollywood dance in that during the showcase, which Shun um, helped with as well. Um, also, I was, I've been in, Vanderbilt student government this past year and economic inclusivity so uh we've been doing initiatives through that um also I'll say um I'm not involved like fully in like women in like STEM organizations but all, always like the people in my classes and like people in Feathering Hill or like Stevenson that I can come to help to um CEVU as well which is like a programming org so like um you know, it's just kind of like Vandy throws a ton of money and you can like organize an event, but the people in that I'm quite close to. Um, and what else is there? Uh, just like other small things as well. Like I'm not Middle Eastern, but like some of my closest friends are. So like being involved in that and they've done like some fundraisers, which is super nice. Um yeah and advocacy as well like we've done that through we just did a Yemen fundraiser with the Muslim Students Association um yeah so th those are just some of them that's great and it sounds like is being Muslim is that something that's easy at on campus it sounds like there's a, a community I know it's come up a couple of times during the conversation um you know in terms of any religion but it just so happens that you know you both mentioned that is is it a, a welcoming community um i'd say like a good thing is that a lot of the meat on like in dining halls is halal which is nice um and also like if it there's a lot of veggie options and we have like a a prayer space as well that people can go to um but like a really nice thing about um the muslim student association is just because like i made a lot of close friends there like um the sophomore girls, like I said, juniors now, and like me and a few freshman girls were like really, really close. Yeah. Um, so that's always a nice thing. Um, so I, I think it's it's not really difficult. It's more just like finding those right friendship groups. I'm not going to be friends with like you know every single Muslim on campus, but finding like, like that right group is right uh, really nice because they'll be involved in so many other things. Like I know someone who's involved in like the interfaith council so like i've i'm going to be involved with that next year as on the multicultural leadership council because we have like like i think 40 umbrella orgs so like each person on board has like a link to those right. each like president of those orgs so like i'll be in contact with um all of those Gotcha. That's cool. It's like once you dip your toes in one group, there's all of these other uh, different pathways to be able to engage and just that first step. Okay. I promise it would be a speed round. Sean, tell me your places, your places at Vandy. I'm sure there's a list. So let's hear them. For anything, just listening to the two of them go off, it's just one of those things that reminds me of how incredible people are. Both of them are just so cool. And it's just like, hello, these are my friends. They're incredible. Um, on my end, Feathering Hill is the big one. I think every engineer will vouch just the lobby in the atrium of Feathering Hill is somewhere you make loads of friends, get help. At one point, the nights before test, everyone in that class will be there. You won't have talked to that person ever, and you'll be like, hi, I need help. And they'll be like, I need help too. And next thing you know, you have a new friend. Um, the VSG office, I will wholeheartedly say I live in, um, A, just because it's my job, but B, um, it's such a central location and a nice private spot to be able to like crank out initiatives and crank out what I need to go about. Um, 
I don't have specific places more often. I just kind of like yeah. around myself with certain people. Alumni lawn, just like whipping out a blanket and just kind of studying in the middle of nature in the middle of campus is lovely because people come back and forth, pop in to say, hey, Sean, like talk about their day and go about it. And it's quite a fun, like I need to study in places that are slightly louder. And so it's just a good spot for me to kind of like crawl myself. Um, Neely Auditorium um, and Langford Auditorium or all the auditoriums basically. <laughs> Uh, my career hopefully is going to be in production and being in technical theater and technical direction. And I will say, I think I spent a solid two weeks at Langford last semester to the point where the production manager like knew, knew me by name and expected me back every weekend. I got an email the first week and we left and was like, hey, where are you at? And I'm just like, that says a lot. <laughs> being in Surat and just like the small shows there and then like working in Neely and whenever I get super overwhelmed and stressed, just texting the director saying, hi, I'm going to go in and finish up this project and being able to build my heart out until I'm like not as stressed anymore. Awesome. And then we're going to have a list of all of your places and activities too. But if anyone has questions about any of these resources or any of these places or wants to engage with any of these people, you want them to engage with you, right? Like that's like, like, like le legit, like you really want to help. And, and I want to make sure people know it's safe to do that, to reach out to you whenever they see this. You, know, you you're, I, I have a feeling you'll always be accessible and always want to help. Uh, my very last question is, if you can go back in time and give you a tip, high school you, what would you tell you? Something that would have made life a little bit easier, something that would have helped you to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. What would you tell high school you, Safa? Um, I would say um, don't always care what people think about you because it's not their life, it's yours. And the only thing that matters is what you're doing for yourself. And don't always feel the need to like prove yourself just because you're a minority and you're a religious minority and you're a woman. And like, you know, people expect like, you know, women of color to be strong and do all these things. But like, if you need a break, take a break. I feel like I was really overworked in high school. Uh, and like, again, like first semester of college, like I can't explain. Whereas now I know like my, like my boundaries and limits and I know to take time for myself, even if that's just like, you know, like every Thursday night, second semester, me and my friends had like a movie night because I'd never have assignments like or like major things on Friday. So like just small things like that. Um, and I always went swimming on Sunday, which is like another thing, but like it was just relaxing. It's so, like taking time for yourself and not feeling, not feeling guilty about that, which I feel like I did feel like kind of, you know, like not doing anything. Like you can feel like guilty as like a, in such an academic place. Yeah, taking care of you and not letting other people impact the things that you need to do to, to really take care of your health and well-being, it sounds like. Yeah, like that's first and foremost. Shun, if you could go back in time and give high school you one piece of advice, what would you tell you? Two things. One, very simply, just to be a little bit louder. Um, I will say the confidence I had in college definitely did not happen was not there in high school. Um, I, there's an ongoing joke that I'm very soft-spoken. I can project in videos, I can project in presentations, but one-on-one, -on -one, I will constantly have to think of, hi, Shun, I can't hear you. I honestly wish that in high school, I did not like let that control out of me. If I was just a little bit louder, I feel like things would be a lot more different, or at least like would be able to kind of like ask for help, stand for myself a little bit more. The other one, quite genuinely, I will say, this is one of the weirder mentalities I have, is to not regret any decision you make. Um, and it, I didn't want to say, like, oh, I wouldn't give advice. I think this was, like, more around what I wanted to say of the actions you take have some reason they happen. Um, this comes from what college you apply to, what major you have, and everything else in between. Don't take a, like, don't take a route and just say, I'm taking this route. And like, if it goes wrong, be like, oh, I wish I like went back and changed it. Take every opportunity as like a learning opportunity to say, I guess, for example, for majors, I started off pre-med, did not like that at all. I did come in as that route and took a semester like that. 
Turns out that's not what I wanted. Took that as a learning opportunity. Found the majors I have now. Uh, everything from who you decide to partner up with for a project to what school you decide to go to. You can always change the route you go about, but you can never change back time. Don't dwell on the past. Kind of dwell on how you can make it better later on. Yeah, that's beautiful. It reminds me of a quote from Nelson Mandela where he says, I never lose, I only win or learn. And I have that on a sweatshirt, actually. Oh, really? It just, it just reminds me. It's actually the name. I have a book coming out in, um, in January. It's called Win or Learn because I just love that. You know, whatever we experience, we're going to draw some knowledge and information. It's going to inform us. And uh, that's a beautiful way to live life. But Tanya, I would love to hear what advice you would give you if you could go back to high school and give high school Batanya one piece of advice, what would you tell you? I think my advice would be to live life as your big Afro black woman identifying first generation self. Um, because as I said before, I was really quiet in high school and a lot of that, um, came not really from um, what people thought of me, but not me, me not fully accepting myself for who I am. Um, and I feel like in college, I've learned that, um, that I am awesome and that um, the people around me are awesome and we can live like that. Like in terms of like, um, just bringing your energy and yourself into every room, every opportunity, and not worrying so much about, like, if you're going to fail at it or um, if people might use, your use like, your stories against you or whatever it is. Just, like, bringing your full self into everything you do and then um, not really worrying about what other people are going to do about that. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And you are all so awesome. I mean, you're incredible. This has been so uh, just so interesting and just so warm and so incredible. And if I were going through the college search process, I would be like so interested in, in Vandy to know that you're just a small representation of a larger community of people who really want students to be successful. Is there anything else that you wanted to include? Um, any clarification, damage control, anything that you wanted to just uh, put out there before I officially sign off? I think I do want to say um, that for people of color on campus, um, at least for black people, I don't want to speak for all people of color, but at least for black people, um, there is a close knit community. And what I've noticed with a lot of um, groups of color is there's a close knit community on campus. Um, and so I came from a very diverse area to it. Nashville so it's very it was a shock for me a little bit um, because my area is very full of diversity and everyone interacts with everyone um, and Vandy is a lot more um, rich and a lot more white than I have experienced in my lifetime and so if if you do experience that as well like just know that there are communities here for you and like um, Obviously, you're not going to get along with every single person of color, <laughs> clearly, but there are, as like Safa was saying earlier, there are groups within that um, that are really cool, and you just got to find your people. Um, I think a lot of times freshman year, people think they find their people immediately, and that's just never true. So like, just take your time, find your people, and like, you'll thrive. Vanderbilt is also a little bit, I would say, segregated um, in terms of like, different groups don't really interact with each other that much much um unless they have like a different interest in in like um together but um just knowing that you don't have to follow what everyone else does if you like someone just hang out with them and i feel like that's how we're like kind of growing past that a little bit yeah that's that's terrific thank you for adding that anybody else before we officially sign off um oh, i'll say as well yeah I'll say as well, like adding to that, like, like, you know, there's a lot of great things about going to like a well-funded, you know, prestigious university. And it's great to have access to so many resources and academics and like people here. But I will say like Vanderbilt or no university is perfect. 
and also like I think the whole like you know like oh going to a good college will like you know fix everything like it does and there'll still be stuff going on in your life and like there's still struggles you face you know with your identity or your background all that um and also just like you know if if you're thinking that you know I want to for example like be at a like a state school in my state I want to be in like a bigger background like there's nothing like wrong with wanting a different type of education like I said like you know I chose to go to the US um I think this whole like you know going to a top university in the US will like fix everything but I feel like that really just comes from like you know their endowment and like how much money they have how much tuition is like um so like you know recognizing that you know going to a good university is great but also like it's not the be it end all there's so many different paths and like you know like even if you go to one of those places, it's, it's not going to be perfect. Um, so that's just my tips on that. Yeah. Uh, the, every, no matter where you go, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable at times. Um, right. As beautiful as it looks on the website and as prestigious as it might be. And I think that's also a real shock for so many people. And like you've made it so clear that you need to find your people in places because it's going to be uncomfortable at times. And you know, I see this over and over again. And I think especially given when you are from a group or organization where you aren't always the most included and the first ones to be acknowledged, um, it's even more important to be intentional. And you just, you, know, you all make that so easy. Anybody else? Oh, can I, I shout out for people of color who kind of want to hear more of the background of their um, university, especially if it's uh, predominantly white, there's this Instagram channel. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but it's called Dear PWI. Um, and so, like, it shows the more negative side. You're not going to hear as much of the positive side, but it will really give you, like, all the tea about universities that are predominantly white and just making sure that you're comfortable um, there if that's the institution you choose. Cool. All right. Well, this is amazing. If anyone has any more questions, reach out. Clearly, you know, an amazing resource, all of the people. Toby also made it very clear. She said, let me know if you have any questions. I want to be there for you. And you are all, you're all so wonderful. If I can be a resource in any way for you or for anybody who's watching this, you know, truly, I want you to live your dream. I want you to get whatever it is that you want. You're worthy. You're deserving of anything that you can dream up and think up. And I want to be there to just remind you and help you and connect you. So today we've been with Vanderbilt University students talking about life on campus, getting in everything and anything. If you have more questions, reach out to them via their social media. You can also connect with me. I'm Harlan Cohn. This is Before College TV Live. Thanks so much for being here. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.